Good morning, Lawrence Heights Christian Church. It's a wonderful day to worship the Lord, amen? Well, I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet as we begin this morning by singing some songs of praise together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven testimony from death to life grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters Bought with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Our God will finish what He started This is my testimony from death to life Grace rewrote my story, I'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony Let's declare this good news together love that song and the exciting part about singing that this morning is we have something really exciting we get to witness in the baptistry. I'm going to invite you to be seated as we get to experience a new life, a new beginning, being made in Christ together. Good morning. Um, my name is Lexi Meyer. This is my oldest daughter, Audrey Meyer. Um, we've been coming to Lawrence Heights since we moved to Lawrence in summer of 2016 when Audrey was just a couple months old. So she's really uh, grown up in this church. Ooh. Sorry, I'm definitely gonna cry. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much to everybody that's in this church um, that has loved and um, helped our kids to learn about Jesus and um, 
have a desire to want to be more like him and spend their lives devoted to him. So I just have two questions for you, Audrey. Can you just look at me? That's okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and rose again and ascended to heaven, conquering death and sin? Yes. And do you promise to spend the rest of your life loving Jesus and learning more to be like him every day? Yes. Okay, ready? It is one of the greatest joys of my life to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, church family, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet as we continue singing together. We're going to sing a new song together this morning. We're going to celebrate our risen Savior. We're going to worship the King of all kings, the Lion and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the giver of new life, new beginnings. Sing this together, church.
Good morning, church family. I have to say, I really enjoy the time we spend together each week taking communion, and I'm thankful that Christ made this illustration uh, to the disciples so that we can follow it and remember his sacrifice ourselves. I find that these are some of the best moments that I have all week. To this point in the service, we've been led in worship by a talented group of people who love God and wish to help us be able to give God the honor he is due. Worship helps bring us close to God and in the right state of mind, humbled and submitted to God's will. And communion affords us some time to remember Christ's sacrifice and to speak directly to him through prayer. On Monday, our church began a journey of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And during this time, we're also reading through the book of John. As I thought about this time of communion, I thought back to John 4. Here, Jesus talks to the woman at the well. We don't know her name, but I think we are like her, lost and in need of Jesus. This passage has good connections to our time of communion. Verse 7 begins with Jesus at the well, and it reads, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? 
his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In verse 13, Jesus continues, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I love how freely Jesus spoke to this woman, a direct invitation to, to living water. You see, Jesus offers this living water to everyone. In John 4, he offered it to a Samaritan, and right now, Jesus offers it to every person on earth. Jesus' sacrifice gives us this living water. So let's drink of this water. Let's invite others to experience this water too. Let's give thanks that Christ's sacrifice for us gives us, the, gives us eternal life with him and also true life here on earth. And his sacrifice gives us this assurance that no matter what happens to us, we will always be God's children and he will always be our father. Here at the Heights, we practice open communion and invite anyone who's placed their faith in Jesus to partake with us. In a moment, the plate will be extended to you. You can take a stack of two cups, the bread underneath the juice, and then you're welcome to take the elements whenever you are ready. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you that we can approach you with great confidence, knowing that we are sinful, but also knowing we're deeply loved. Let us take hold of the forgiveness available to us through your son, Jesus. Let us live with confidence, knowing that you're always with us. Lord, with you, we can fulfill our mission here on this earth. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
family, there's no rush at all, but whenever you're ready, please stand as we continue to sing together. Praise our wonderful Savior. Now. 
Welcome to Lawrence Heights Christian Church. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. My name is Ben, and I'm one of the pastors on staff, and we are delighted that you're with us this morning uh, to worship the Lord. We're a church that's on mission to follow Jesus, love people, and reach the world as we chase after this God-sized vision, this God-sized dream to reach 1% of Lawrence for Jesus. I want to encourage you to fill out a connect card that's found in your bulletin. Uh, that way we can know how to pray for you and how to best get you connected at the church. And if it's your first time here, we've got a gift to give you. How about that, huh? It's so cool. We, we'd love to get that to you. And you can put your connect card in the offering box that is found at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, I just want to take a moment again to celebrate Audrey Meyer's baptism. So thrilling, so wonderful. We love Audrey, proud of her, and what a special day to celebrate as a church family. Our prospective member class Into the Heights is happening this Tuesday night from 6 to 8 p.m. So if you've been attending for a while and you're trying to figure out more about the church or you think that this might be your church home, uh, we would love for you to be there Tuesday night, 6 to 8 p.m. You can email me to RSVP or you can find me after the service. This Saturday, we have a special opportunity to reach out to our neighbors and to be a blessing to the community. We'll be meeting at the church at 9 a.m., and we're going to go door to door in our neighborhood, just passing out some gift bags saying thank you to our neighbors for, for being such an important part of our community, and then inviting them to our upcoming block party that's going to be on Saturday, August 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, if you'd like to get involved, an additional way that you could help is to fill gift bags this Friday evening at the church from 7 to 8 p.m. And uh, again, we're going to meet on Saturday at 9 a.m. right here. Uh, what a great opportunity to impact the neighborhood for Christ. And would encourage you, if you have any questions, to reach out to Conrad Mast. I want to remind everyone about our prayer team that meets on Thursday nights. Uh, they meet on 615 right here at the church. And as we're going through this 21 days of prayer and fasting, that would be a great opportunity for you to pray with fellow believers and to get to know some more people here at the church. A lot of our students are going back to school this week, and we have all sorts of people in our congregation uh, that are going back to school too. Uh, we've got teachers and support staff and administrators and professors and all kinds of people that are involved in the education system. So uh, if you're a student or if you're going back to work with students or you work with KU Campus Christians, I would ask for all of you uh, that are in that role to stand at this time, and we are going to pray God's blessing over you before we study the Bible together. Do we have anyone in the school system? Ah, there we go. I knew we did. Students, stand up. If you work with the schools, you work with college students, stand up. We would love to pray for you right now. If you're near someone, I'd invite you to, to raise your hands and to extend them towards that person. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for another day to worship you as a church family. Thank you for sending Jesus to save us from our sins. Lord, at this time, we pray for all of our church family who uses their gifts and talents to be a blessing to students. We pray for your blessing this school year, for their mental and emotional health, and for their continual encouragement in you. God, help us to continue to grow in our faith and our love for the lost during these 21 days of prayer and fasting. I pray for our mind to be focused and our hearts to be receptive to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2015, a website launched called Masterclass. 
And the idea was really simple. It was an opportunity for you to stream classes online from the best in the world at their profession. Their motto is learn from the best and be your best. And it's actually pretty incredible the amount of people that they have corralled together to do these online classes. Here are just a few of the classes that they offer. You can learn from basketball superstar Steph Curry about shooting, ball handling, and scoring. You can learn from Ken Burns about documentary filmmaking. This is one's really cool because the Olympics are wrapping up today. You can learn from Simone Biles about the fundamentals of gymnastics. You can learn from Reba McIntyre about country music. I mean, come on, that's awesome. You can learn how to cook from Gordon Ramsay. You can learn about writing from Malcolm Gladwell. And you can learn about being a band from Metallica. Now, I haven't done any of these master classes, but there are several on the website that look really interesting to me, and I have no doubt that I would really enjoy them. But we're in for an even better treat this morning because we're going to get a master class from Jesus about prayer. This morning, we're going to study what's become known to Christians throughout the centuries as the Lord's Prayer. Last week, we kicked off a brand new series called Conversations with God, and it's all about prayer. And our big idea for the series is this. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. We want prayer to be a priority in our lives and something that we are deeply committed to as a church. We also kicked off 21 days of prayer and fasting And if you missed last week, I'd encourage you to watch the message on our YouTube channel or on our website. We talked a lot about fasting and also talked through some principles about how to improve our prayer lives. Last week when we talked about fasting, we defined it like this. Christian fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. When Jesus talked about fasting, he was thinking about abstaining from food to focus on God. And we recognize that not everyone is able to fast from food due to health concerns. And so throughout church history, many people have fasted from other things to focus on God for a period of time. If you grew up Catholic, you probably fasted from something during Lent, or at least you were supposed to. Our spiritual purpose for these 21 days is to pray for a lost friend every single day. And we encourage everyone in our church to have another purpose or two as well. We've got bookmarks in the lobby that will help you with this for the remainder of the 21 days. We're spending seven minutes a day in the Word, seven minutes in prayer, and seven minutes listening to a worship song to draw us closer to Jesus. So grab a bookmark and join us. Uh, Today we're on day seven, and for our time in the Word, we're walking through the Gospel of John one chapter a day. And so if you're just joining us now, you can read two chapters a day, and you'll be caught up in no time. As a brief reminder, there are four types of fasting that we discussed. The first is the complete fast, and that is liquids only. So you got no solid food in the complete fast. The next type of fast is the partial fast, and that's fasting from certain meals or during a designated time. The early church would fast two days a week from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and that's a partial fast. Next, there's the selective fast, and that's removing certain elements from your diet. Daniel in the Bible ate only vegetables and water for 21 days, and so that is a selective fast that's known as the Daniel fast. And then lastly, there's the soul fast, and that's giving up something that you enjoy to focus more on Jesus. You could give up social media or watching TV or secular music. And the great thing about fasting is that when you feel a hunger pain, or when you pull out your phone and you're tempted to get on an app that you love, it's a reminder to hunger for God. And it's a reminder to pray. We are starving the flesh and we are feeding the spirit. Now that our fasting refresher is over, we can begin our master class with Jesus. It's amazing to think about how many incredible things the disciples saw during their time with Jesus. For three years, they were like his shadow, Wherever Jesus went, they went too. Think about the astonishing things that they witnessed. They saw him teach the most amazing things that anyone has ever taught in the world. Jesus was this incredible storyteller, and he would tell stories that everyone could relate to and use them to explain what God is like and what the kingdom is like. And the disciples, they would have seen him perform countless miracles. He turned water into wine. 
He healed people with leprosy. He calmed the storms. He cast out demons. He fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. The disciples had seen some amazing things during the ministry of Jesus. And you'd think that they'd ask him, how do I teach like you? How can I become a better storyteller and teach people about God? Or maybe they'd ask him, how can I do miracles like you do? Or maybe they'd say, Jesus, how do we walk on water like you did? We'd ask Peter, but we think it's better to ask you. The Bible records only one thing that the disciples asked of Jesus, one thing that they asked him to teach them, and that's found in Luke chapter 11 when they said this, Lord, teach us to pray. It's really interesting that they asked him to teach them to pray because these are Jewish men. They've heard prayers their whole life in the synagogues from rabbis. But there was something about Jesus that was different. His prayers were personal and they were vibrant and they were unlike anything that they'd ever heard before. Jesus gave his disciples a compelling example for what a life in prayer and conversation with God was like. He prayed before he ate. He prayed for the sick. He prayed with thankfulness. He prayed through tears. Jesus created the whole world, yet he still found it so important to take time to pray. Now, the Lord's Prayer is found in two places in your Bible. It is found in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. And today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. I'd love for us to read this prayer together as a church family. And then what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the prayer line by line. We're going to put the prayer up on the screens and we will pray this together to our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many people grew up in a church setting where they said that prayer every week. But for a lot of people, that they said it so many times, it just kind of lost its meaning. And they would pray it and they would say those words, but they wouldn't really think about it. I read this week about two men who were talking about familiar spiritual things. Uh, they grew up in the church and they were talking about famous passages in God's word. And these guys, they hadn't been to church in years and years, but they were kind of having fun uh, reminiscing about it. And one of them made a bet that he could repeat the Lord's Prayer. And the other person said, I'll take you up on it. And so they made a wager and the guy began to repeat. He said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. And the other guy listened very intently and he said, I didn't think you could do it. Here's your money. <laughs> now, I would think that those guys had probably heard the Lord's Prayer and prayed it in their congregations many, many times, but it became something that didn't really mean anything to them. They didn't understand it. And in Matthew 6, verse 9, Jesus says, pray then in this way. He's saying, pray like this. He's saying, this is a template for prayer. This is an outline for prayer. This is a framework for your prayer life. These are categories of what Jesus wants his people to pray about. The Lord's prayer is a pattern for prayer. Now, I mentioned earlier that some church traditions recite this prayer weekly in worship. So it's not just a pattern. In fact, in Luke 11, Jesus says, when you pray, say this. So the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that we can pray verbatim, and it's also a prayer that we can personalize for specific needs in our life. Jesus gives us categories of things to pray for, and the beginning of the prayer is all about praying for God's glory, and the second half of the prayer is all about our human needs. And so we've got to remember that Jesus gives us this pattern after a couple of warnings on prayer. He warned us to not pray like the religious leaders because they would pray to be seen by other people. And Jesus said, don't do that. When you pray, go into your closet and pray in secret and your father who is in heaven, he sees you, he hears you, and he will reward you for that. He also warned us against praying like the pagans 
or praying like people who didn't believe in the one true God. He said they would pray to their false gods babbling on and on and using vain repetition and praying for a long, long time because they thought the longer the prayer, the better. And Jesus said, don't, don't pray like them. Pray sincerely and authentically and in secret. And he reminds us that our Father knows what we need before we even ask him. Now that's comforting to me. Now, it's very important that we understand the gravity of the first six words in this prayer, our Father who is in heaven. This short phrase brings us to a truth that is very important for all of us to grasp and understand, and that's this. Jesus teaches us that our God is a relational and loving Father. Father implies relationship. In Christian people, we relate to God as his children. The Bible makes it very clear that the only people who can call God their father are those who have a relationship with Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, no one comes to the father except through me. John 1, 12 says, to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. A relationship with God is only possible through Jesus Christ. Now, this idea of God as a relational and loving father was radical for Jesus' original hearers. Many Jewish people viewed God as distant and remote and a faded figure who had once guided their ancestors. And Jesus said, God is not like that. God's a loving father who cares for his kids. The word that Jesus Jesus uses for father is the word Abba. And it's an intimate term for father, similar to the word papa or daddy for us. But in Jewish culture, you would call your dad Abba for your whole life, even as an adult. And for us, we typically only use the term daddy as children. But the gravity of this remains the same. God is approachable and he's caring and he's kind and he's our father. He's our dad. And if you've got a great earthly dad, this makes sense. But for some people, this idea of God as a loving father is disorienting and it's confusing and it doesn't make sense because their earthly father was abusive or absent or continually rude and dismissive. And if that's the case for you, I'm so sorry because that's not what God wants dads to be like. Clovis Chapel said, take fatherhood at its best and lift it into the realm of the infinite and you will have some conception of God. God, our Father, is perfect and he's holy. And we got to remember, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And he also said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus is this complete and perfect picture of what God is like. If you're a Christian, you are a child of God. But you're not an only child. He doesn't tell us to pray my Father, but our Father. And that's a reminder that The people of God are a family. The Christian faith is a family of faith. Our culture is highly individualistic, and we're kind of like a bunch of toddlers running around, and we just think me, myself, and I. But you will not find those words in the Lord's Prayer. There is no I in team, and there is no I in the Lord's Prayer either. The Lord's Prayer is a communal prayer. It's reminding us that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are connected to each other because of Jesus' death on the cross. So God is our relational and loving Father, and the text says that he's in heaven. And this is our reminder that although God is everywhere, and he's all-powerful, and he's creator of the world, heaven is the place of perfection, and God is our perfect Father. The beginning of this model prayer teaches us to approach God as a relational and loving Father, And the next line of the prayer says this, hallowed be your name. What this line of the prayer teaches us is to pray for God's name to be honored and worshiped. We could put that up on the screen. Now, hallowed is not a word that we use very often. We might refer to it as a place as as being of hallowed ground, but it's certainly not a word that we use in everyday life. Hallow means to make holy, to honor, to revere, to glorify and worship. Jesus tells us that God's name is to be honored and worshiped. In Hebrew, when someone referred to God's name, they were referring not just to his title, but to his nature, character, and personality. In fact, in the Old Testament, God is called many different Hebrew names, 
each of which amplified a different aspect of his character. El Shaddai means the Lord God Almighty. Adonai means Lord and Master. Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Ra means the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha means the Lord that heals. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. And those are just a few of the names that we see for God in the Bible. And if you're unfamiliar with those names and you can't remember those names, it's okay. Just say, I hallow the name of Jesus. The name above every name. The only name by which any of us can be saved. When we pray for God's name to be honored, we are praying for God to be honored for who he is. And he's holy and he's kind and he's gracious and merciful and powerful and he is worthy of our worship. The Lord's prayer begins with praise. And we don't just pray that, we model that. We don't take the Lord's name in vain. We don't use the Lord's name flippantly or casually. We honor and hallow his name by the way that we live our lives and the way we represent him as Christ's ambassadors. The next line in the prayer is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This means that we pray for God's agenda. This is God's world and God wants things to be done his way. It makes me think of the great Vernon McGee quote where he said, this is God's universe and God does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. This means that we are praying for God's interests, not our own. We're praying for God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. Notice that in Jesus' pattern for prayer here, everything starts with God. God comes first. God's the priority. It all begins with God. Before we get to any of our requests, before we get to our needs or our desires, we start with praising the name of God, and we are praying for his agenda, not our own. Robert Law said that prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. We pray for God's rule and God's reign in the world and in our lives personally. And what does it look like for the kingdom of God to come and his will to be done? Well, remember, this model prayer is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus preaches and teaches about what it looks like to live life in the kingdom. What's that mean? What's the kingdom like? It's a kingdom where we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. It's a kingdom where we go the extra mile for others. It's a kingdom of self-sacrifice and self-denial. It's a kingdom of love for all people. It's a kingdom where grace and truth reign supreme. It's a kingdom where greatness is not about power and status, but greatness is about serving. It's a kingdom where Jesus is king and where all people are invited to be a part of the kingdom of God as it comes to earth. When we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're also praying for our king to come back and to establish his kingdom permanently. Because make no mistake, the king already came and he is coming again. Jesus is currently sitting at the right hand of God and he reigns as king. But Jesus is not just the spiritual king of the church. He's the king of the universe. And not everyone acknowledges that yet, but one day people will. Every knee's going to bow. Jesus tells us to pray for the kingdom of God to be made visible on earth. That is God's agenda. Well, how does this happen? You'll find in this prayer that, that we don't just pray for these things to happen, but we work to answer them. We pray for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done, and then we do things in our life that bring about the kingdom on earth here and now to impact the lives of those around us. Christians are kingdom people. A mark of Christian maturity is that you become way more concerned with building God's kingdom than you are your earthly brand. He says we do this to embody the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, everything's perfect. So in essence, we are praying to bring heaven to earth and earth to heaven. After we pray for his agenda, we shift to the next line in the prayer. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. This is telling us to pray for God's provision. Notice that it's a prayer for daily bread, not daily filet mignon. And if you're watching carbs, you can pray for daily lettuce. I don't know. 
This is not just a verse that is talking about food, but all of our needs. And we understand our need for God's provision. Martin Luther explained what this looks like and what it means to pray for daily bread. He said this, Everything necessary for the preservation of this life is bread, including food, a healthy body, good weather, house, home, wife, children, good government, and peace. We pray for God to provide for our needs, not our lavish wants. I think our country, we we live in a place of wealth and excess, and a lot of times we confuse what a need is and what something is that's a want. I would say that that in our society, it's probably pretty important to have a cell phone today. Seems like a wise and, and prudent thing to do. But too many Americans think that that means they need the latest iPhone, even when they can't afford it. Also, this petition of prayer is hard for us to really comprehend. Because most of us are so blessed that we've never had a day in our lives where we were concerned about having enough food to eat. And honestly, for many of us, this part of the Lord's Prayer is going to turn into a time of thankfulness to the Lord. When we recognize His faithfulness and His provision and His kindness and grace in our lives. It's important to note that Jesus tells us to pray for daily bread. This teaches us to live one day at a time and not to worry about tomorrow not to get anxious about the future. Some people have misinterpreted this prayer to be a reason to sit back, relax, and wait for bread to show up on their doorstep. If someone prayed this prayer and sat back, sat back and waited for bread to fall into their hands, they would starve. Prayer and work go hand in hand. Think of it like this. You can pray for your marriage to improve, and that's a great prayer. But you've got to work at it too. Farmers, they they pray for their daily bread, but they go out and work in the fields. You can pray for God to bless your business, but if you don't go out and grind and work really hard, God doesn't have anything to bless. The Bible says that faith without works is dead, and the same is true of prayer. You can pray for God to help us reach 1% of Lawrence for Jesus, and I hope you do pray that prayer. I pray that prayer. But it's not enough just to pray it. We've got to get after it and love lost people and build relationships and make a difference. It was really important for the Apostle Paul to guard against laziness in the church. In 2 Thessalonians 3, he talks about the importance of hard work. And in verse 10, he says, The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We thank God for his provision, and we recognize that everything comes from him, while simultaneously remembering that we are to honor the Lord by working hard and doing our best in all things. There was a man who bought this beautiful home out in the country, and when he bought it, the property was a mess. And he worked really, really hard to reclaim the land, and now it looked beautiful. He cleared away so many rocks and so many weeds, and he planted beautiful flowers in a thriving garden that produced these beautiful fruits and vegetables. And one evening, he had one of his buddies from church over, and he was showing him around. And his buddy said this to him, it's wonderful what God can do with a bit of ground like this, isn't it? And the man replied, yes, but you should have seen this bit of ground when God had it to himself. The Lord has blessed us in so many ways. And living the Christian life and and living in a Christ-like way and doing our best for the Lord is one of the ways that we can bless him in return. After praying for God's provision, we go to verse 12, as well as verses 14 and 15. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if we forgive other people when they sin against you, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Our fourth category for prayer is to pray for God's forgiveness as we forgive others. Jesus assumes that as we ask for forgiveness, we've already forgiven those who sinned against us. Jesus lists forgiving others as being a prerequisite for the Christian life. It's a prerequisite for God forgiving us. This is the only part of the prayer that is repeated twice. On the surface, it might look like this is advocating for a works-based salvation, but nothing could be further from the truth. This section of the Lord's Prayer shows us that followers of Jesus will be a forgiving people. An unforgiving disciple is an oxymoron. 
bitter and grudge-holding Christians go against everything that Jesus taught. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, they said, how often should we forgive other people? Seven times? They thought that was a lot. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. He was using hyperbole to show people that the people of God are always going to forgive others. N.T. Wright said, the heart that will not open to forgive others will remain closed when God's own forgiveness is offered. When you go to buy a car, a salesman is going to try to get you to buy all type of upgrades. For a few thousand dollars more, you can add some luxurious features like heated seats, premium sound systems, or even this advanced technology like auto assist. I don't know if you've heard of this. Auto assist is unbelievable. You can be driving in your car, and if you veer off track, it'll it'll correct for you. My wife really wishes that I had it. We don't. (laughs) But I think some Christians can fall into a trap of viewing forgiveness like one of those car upgrades. We see it as an optional feature, but but not essential. We focus on our own personal forgiveness of God, and we think, hey, that's the main thing, and forgiving others becomes a secondary concern. It's an add-on that we might consider if it's convenient, but if not, we're not going to worry about it. But in reality, forgiving others is not an optional upgrade in the Christian life. It's not a feature that we can take or leave. Forgiveness is at the core of what it means to follow Jesus It's as fundamental as the engine in a car. It's what drives us forward. When we forgive, we reflect the heart of God, and it's meant to be a hallmark of our lives as Christians. And when you understand how much God has forgiven you, forgiving others is a natural progression. Because God has forgiven the worst in us, and we are to forgive the worst in others. This is something that that in and of ourselves and our own power, we're not capable of doing. But God helps us to do this. He helps us forgive others. On September 6, 2018, there was an off-duty police officer named Amber Geiger who accidentally entered the wrong apartment in her building. Believing that the man inside to be an an intruder, she tragically shot and killed him. The man was Botham Jean, a young black man. The incident sparked widespread protests throughout our country and intense discussions about race and justice in America as as Amber Geiger is white and Botham Jean was black. After Amber Geiger was sentenced to 10 years in prison, Botham Jean's brother Brandt asked to speak in the courtroom. And what he said next shocked the country and moved many people to tears. Brandt looked at Amber He looked at this woman who had killed his brother, and this is what he said. I forgive you, and I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you just like anyone else, and I'm not going to say that I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I personally want the best for you. And I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because that's exactly what both of them would have wanted for you. And the best would be to give your life to Christ. Again, I I love you as a person and I don't wish anything bad on you. And I don't know if it's possible, but can I give her a hug, please? And with the judge's permission, Amber and Brandt embraced for almost a full minute. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. What a beautiful moment of forgiveness. And this type of forgiveness, it's not possible apart from Jesus Christ. The Lord's Prayer teaches us that forgiveness is going to be a part of the regular rhythms of being a Christian. It's part of what it means to walk with Jesus. And as we receive daily forgiveness from God, we forgive others too. And the last line in the Lord's Prayer is this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this brings us to our final category that Jesus teaches us to pray about, and that's to pray for God's protection. Pray for God's protection. The first two words of this petition are powerful. Jesus prays, tells us to pray for God to lead us. We pray to be led by Jesus. We don't want to be our own leader. I've tried to be self-sufficient before. I've tried that route. It does not work out well. 
this part of the prayer asks for God to lead and guide us in our lives. We pray for his protection from the temptations that ail us and from deliverance from the evils that surround us. Upon first reading, verse 13 seems a bit puzzling. We ask God to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. But from other places in the Bible, we already know that God will not tempt us to sin. That would go against his nature. James 1.13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God's not going to tempt us, but the world certainly is. Some scholars have said that a more accurate rendering of the Greek might be, do not allow us to be led into temptation. We're asking God to lead us into places where we won't be vulnerable to fall into sin. The interesting thing about temptation is that we're all different. Things that tempt me might not tempt you. And things that tempt you might not tempt me. And we've got to understand ourselves and what tempts us so that we can stay on guard against the devil's schemes. Because we all battle sin this side of heaven. It's a part of the Christian life. This ongoing battle between the spirit and the flesh, between what we want to do and what God wants us to do. And one of the most dangerous places that any of us can be in the Christian life is to think that we're immune from temptation. Rich Mullins was right when he sang, we are not as strong as we think we are. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, whoever thinks he stand, stands must be careful not to fall. To live is to be tempted. And there are spiritual forces at work in this world that are actively working to sabotage your life and your faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. There is a spiritual war that is going on all around us and the only way to be successful in the war, the only way to be prepared is to stay close to the king. We flee from temptation, we run from it, and we stay as close to Jesus as we possibly can. One of the ways that we stay away from temptation is by knowing ourselves. Because sometimes, honestly, we're our own worst enemy. And we put ourselves in situations that we know aren't good for us. I heard about a small group that was starting up for the first time. And it didn't take long. And people were talking about what they were tempted by and what struggles they had. One guy said, I struggle with being impatient towards my wife and kids. One woman said, I struggle with greed and envy. I'm constantly comparing myself to others. Another guy said, I struggle with lust and impure thoughts, and I'm in the battle right now. Gets around to the last guy, and he says, I struggle with gossip, and I am loving this. So we need to set up guardrails in our lives to ensure that we stay close to Jesus And we pray for his protection and deliverance in our lives. In your Bible, there might be a footnote that has, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And the reason that that's not included in the verse is because the earliest manuscripts of Matthew do not contain it. But it's still a great reminder that God is on the throne and that he's all powerful and that his kingdom is eternal. I don't know if you notice it or not, but I love how the Lord's Prayer offers up our past, present, and future to God. We ask for forgiveness from what we've done in the past. We ask for God's provision for our present needs. And we ask for God to lead us in the future. I'd encourage you to use this sermon outline during your time in prayer this week. Pray through these categories that we discussed today. Remember that we are to approach God as our relational and loving Father. First, pray for God's name to be worshipped and honored. Revere and glorify the name of Jesus. Praise God for who he is and thank him for all he's done in your life. Next, we pray for God's agenda. We pray for the kingdom to advance on earth and for his will to be done. And we pray for ways that we can personally advance God's kingdom. Next, we pray for God's provision We pray for our needs to be met by the power of God and we thank him for his faithfulness. Then we pray for God's forgiveness as we forgive others and we remember that Jesus tells us that, hey, we are a forgiving people and we ask God forgiveness and we pray for God to help us forgive others. And lastly, we pray for God's protection. We pray for God's leading in our lives and protection against temptation. 
Pray the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for prayer in your life this week as we continue to draw near to God during this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise your name. We praise the name of Jesus. We praise you for your love and grace in our lives. We pray for your kingdom to advance in our families, in our city, and in our world as it is in heaven. We pray for your will to be done in our lives, not our own. Provide for our needs, Father, and we thank you for your faithful provision. Forgive us of the times that we sin and fall short as we forgive others who have sinned against us. Guide us in your truth and protect us against temptation. Deliver us from the evil that surrounds us. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now is the time in our service where we offer a song of invitation. And you might be here and you don't have a relationship with the Father because you don't know Jesus. And we'd love for you to come down the aisle during this song. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be saved, about what it means to become a Christian and to experience the forgiveness of God for the very first time. If that's you and that feels a little bit too intimidating to come down the aisle, find someone in the church that you know loves Jesus and talk to them. There are people here that love you and want to help you know what it means to follow Christ. Or if you're here this morning and you just need prayer, you can come forward too. Let's stand and let's sing together.
shelter and shepherd. Shelter, shepherd, Savior, King, I give everything to you. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, church. It's been wonderful worshiping with you all, and we hope to see you next Sunday. Have a great week, church.